and I wish you all a very fruitful engagement. Thank you. Hi, um, good afternoon, everybody. And thank you so much for inviting me to speak today. Um, in particular, I wish to thank um, Dr. Adatiba, whose invitation was just so courteous. And he's been meticulous in keeping me informed about the organization of this event. So thank you so much. It's a, a real honor to be speaking at the African Studies Center at Rhodes University today. I'm really delighted to be here. Um, and it's been really interesting for me to have the opportunity to think through the question of the role of traditional medicine in the COVID-19 pand pandemic in African countries, and particularly Tanzania, which is where I've done my research. And also thank you to Professor Msindo for remembering Edinburgh University, and it's really nice to hear that you have um, friends and colleagues here as well. So, so I'm a, um, just to position myself before I start, I talk, I'm a medical and social anthropologist. Um, so what I can talk about is the, um, the social and political place of um, traditional and herbal medicine. So I'm not an ethnopharmacologist. I'm not able to comment on the pharmaceutical efficacy of um, herbal medicine, but I can talk about the symbolic efficacy of um, herbal medicine. And I can also talk about the relationship of, um, of states and biomedicine towards herbal medicine as well. So that's what I'm going to talk about today. I'm going to begin by um, talking about um, the situation in, in, in Tanzania recently and the response of um, the late President Magafuli to, um, to COVID-19 and his advocacy of um, traditional medicine. And then I'm going to backtrack a bit and talk a bit, a, bit, a bit more about what traditional medicine actually is and who uses it based on my own research in Tanzania. And then what I'm going to do is um, Whilst thinking about this talk, I, I, I began to realize that certainly in terms of understanding the Tanzanian case, it's really important to understand the relationship between traditional medicine and the state. And so I'm going to talk about how various um, turns in Tanzanian history since the colonial period have been really, um, um, have really shaped the practice of traditional medicine practitioners um, through various forms of disciplining. So to, be, to begin by talking about the current situation, COVID-19 and traditional medicine in Tanzania. In June last year, 2020, the late president of Tanzania, John Wagafuli, claimed that Tanzania was COVID free and that a three day prayer had saved the country. And no data on um, COVID, on coronavirus has been published since then. There have been mixed reports in the media of uh, doctors being afraid to officially diagnose COVID-19 so for example, Dr. Mwibambe, who's the president of the Medical Association of Tanzania, recently stated in the British Medical Journal that we were struggling to stand our ground as doctors to warn the public about COVID. And that the Medical Association of Tanzania were only able to allude to COVID using terms such as breathing problems or to attribute deaths to pneumonia, asthma or heart disease. So, there were no treatment guidelines available because the disease didn't officially exist in the country. And the government suggested that any deaths were only because people were dying from anxiety. A statement which reminded me of um, the time that I was working in Tanzania, particularly um, at the turn of the last century, at the peak of the HIV pandemic, um, when doctors were often afraid to diagnose somebody as HIV positive, but not because of the response of the government, but because they were afraid that patients would die of shock on receiving that diagnosis. So Magafuli was against vaccination, against vaccination um, implying that it has not yet been fully tested and that Tanzanians should not be expected to take the risk. And he also invoked post-colonial orders of power, stating that if the white man was able to come up with vaccinations, he should have found a vaccination for AIDS, cancer, and by now, tuberculosis. And instead, the advice for Tanzanians was to live a healthy lifestyle, um, and particularly um, nutrition and steam inhalation of herbal medicines was recommended. So on February 21st this year, the Minister of Health, Dorothy, Dorothy Gwajima, advocated what was described in the press as unproven remedies. She was seen in a video inhaling steam from herbal medicines, and she advocated making vegetable smoothies containing ginger, lemons and pepper to protect from coronavirus, which itself, um, I'll come back to this um, a little bit later in the talk, 
because it um, is reminiscent of um, a recent interest in what in Swahili people call Dalazakulishi, which is medicine that comes from food. Dr. Gradrima made a statement that we must improve our personal hygiene, wash our hands with running water and soap, use handkerchiefs and use natural remedies that our nation is endowed with and eat nutritious food and drink plenty of water, use herbal steams and exercise. She said that though the chief government chemist, through the chief government chemist, the ministry has been working to inspect a number of natural remedies that have met the safety standards for use and are already in use and that they've helped Tanzanians, including her and her family. Um, on the media, uh, um, a video of a woman circulated who was recommending that people used inhalation of lemongrass and sweet wormwood. Sweet wormwood is the, um, the name for the plant um, which is used to make the antimalarial artemisinin, which was discovered by um, practitioners of Chinese traditional medicine. Um, and in this video, um, she said that the pathogens, um, when, she, when she uses steam inhalation, she said that the pathogens leave the body in her sweat. Um, and the article um, that came with this video also cited that people use neem, a plant which is known as marabaini, which in Swahili means um, the number 40, which refers to the 40 diseases that it can treat, um, ginger and lemon. Now, President Magafuli died officially, well, uh, President Magafuli died from heart disease on the 17th of March this year. Um, and there were a lot of rumors, of course, that it was really COVID-19 and I'm sure we'll never know um, whether the rumours are true or not. Um, and after that, the new president, Samir Suluhu Hassan, is said to be more willing to reinstate reporting of COVID-19. And the chief medical officer said that they were assessing whether or not the vaccines would be suitable for use in the country. And indeed, last weekend, on the 5th of June, um, in the Citizen Reporter, there was an announcement that Tanzania is indeed going to vaccinate and it's going to start releasing data following the recommendation by this team. So what can we make of President, the late President Magafuli's response to refuse to test for COVID and to refuse to di distribute vaccines? And in a sense, why does this even matter when the vaccines, um, as I'm sure you discussed um, at the previous symposia, are not available to the majority of people? Um, what does it mean when a political leader refuses to take part in the global vaccination, vaccination campaign when the vaccines aren't forthcoming in any case? And there's an analogy with this situation, um, analogy with what happened um, during the pandemic um, of HIV and AIDS. And I was put in mind when I was thinking about this of the work of the anthropologist Didier Fassin, who wrote a book called When Bodies Remember, um, and his analysis of the reaction to um, the South African president's stance against antiretroviral drugs, that's Tabo and Becky, and his position that HIV and AIDS was caused by poverty. And I'm sure you will all, of course, understand this much better than I do, but according to Didier Fassan's work, he said that Mbeki was roundly condemned for this and for advocating the use of traditional medicine instead of antiretrovirals. And Fassan argues that the way that the debate was played out meant that the truth of the relationship between poverty and HIV was lost, with the structural determinants of disease taking say, second place to faith in pharmaceuticals or herbal medicines. And the consequences of Mbeki's position were ironically that impoverished South Africans living with HIV and AIDS were subject to another layer in the impossibility of gaining access to antiretrovirals. So first the fight had been against the pharmaceutical industry in order to gain access, and then it was against the president. So of course, I'm going to focus on Tanzania because I have no expertise on South Africa, but I mention Fassan's work on, um, on this because there's an interesting parallel with the recent events in Tanzania. The late president has been roundly condemned for his response to COVID-19 by the World Health Organization and much of the world's media. It's hard for me to say what the view is from within Tanzania. Reports suggest that there has been dissent, but also fear at articulating it in public. The picture, of course, is complicated by the fact that Magufuli was simultaneously a popular president who cracked down on corruption and improved infrastructure, but he was also said to be authoritarian, and there were rumours of, um, of journalists who critiqued him in the press and opposition politicians disappearing. So it's very difficult to get a good understanding of what the views of the Tanzanian public were under such circumstances, and even more difficult from outside the country, which, of course, is where I have been. So on the one hand, we have Magafuli 
refusing to continue testing for COVID-19, refusing to release data, and refusing to support vaccination. And this has been rightly condemned during a pandemic that requires global cooperation. On the other hand, he had a point in that the notion of global cooperation conceals inequalities. When he said that there was no vaccine for AIDS, malaria or tuberculosis, we have to take notice that these diseases have been killing millions of people for decades and that there has been nothing like the rapid response of the biomedical scientific community and the governments and corporations that fund them as there has been for COVID-19. So refusing to take part in a global vaccination campaign when the vaccines are clearly not forthcoming has perhaps more of a symbolic effect than it does an immediate practical effect. Even if he had gone along with vaccination, we have to ask what proportion of the Tanzanian populations would have received a vaccine. What he did instead was to draw on a long-standing Tanzania value, which in Swahili is called Kujitegamea, which means to depend upon oneself. And that he advocated that people use Tanzanian traditional medicine. Now, what I want to argue today though, is that it is probably not a straightforward support of traditional medicine on his part. Instead, what's going on is that there's a false dichotomy drawn up in which biomedicine symbolizes imperialism and a very specific form of traditional medicine symbolizes an independent nation. And interestingly, the kind of traditional medicine that his government advocated was the find that biomedicine finds most respectable, miti shamba, um, and the, the Swahili word for herbal medicine. So what is traditional medicine and who uses it? So as um, Professor Msindo has already said to us, in a lot of African countries, and in fact, globally, I would say the healthcare is pluralistic. The healthcare system is pluralistic. That means that diff different medical traditions coexist and they're based on different worldviews. So for example, in Tanzania, you have biomedicine, which is based on the principles of biology and biochemistry. You have spirit diviners, herbalists, Pentecostal churches, Chinese medicine, Islamic medicine, healers who specialize in anti-witchcraft medicine, traditional birth attendants, just to name a few. And some people assumed that after the introduction of biomedicine during the period of colonialism, other medical systems would gradually disappear, but this wasn't the case. The widespread availability of other kinds of medicine is evidence enough that biomedicine does not meet everybody's needs either because people do not have access to it, which I think is particularly important, or because it does not have the appropriate expertise to address certain conditions. So if we look at the history of traditional medicine in African countries, we can see that there are particular kinds of condition which prompt discussions about it, like, like COVID-19 right now, when it steps into the vacant space of biomedicine. And these have been mental health, childbirth, and HIV and AIDS, and of course now COVID-19. And most often in this kind of situation, it's herbal medicines that are promoted. Now, there are other speakers today who have far more expertise on herbal medicine than I do, but there are a couple of points that I want to make about them. First of all, and I'll, I'll, I'll go more into this um, further in the talk, they have been constructed through, by the state really to be like the pharmaceuticals of medicine, of biomedicine. But they're not, I don't think, necessarily analogous to biomedical pharmaceuticals, because first of all, not all biomed herbal medicines require specialist knowledge. So for example, those which were recommended to be used for COVID-19 in Tanzania were widely known of by members of the public and used to treat symptoms for other diseases. So during my research in the early 2000s, I found that people commonly used herbal medicines or meaty shamba for a variety of things without consulting even a traditional doctor. So it was fairly common knowledge. Um, and so the point that I'm wanting to make here, I guess, is that not all public health knowledge is linked to healers of any form. Um, so often people use herbal medicine for malaria when they were first unable to go to the hospital in order to reduce the symptoms or as a first aid, especially if they didn't have enough money with which to buy anti-malarial pharmaceuticals. Suitable plants were growing around the area where they lived and most people were able to identify a few and knew how to use them. So one of the herbal medicines that I mentioned earlier Mwarabaini, um, which has been identified as having potential use for COVID-19, was used to treat malaria in a very similar way, by boiling the leaves in water, covering the head with a blanket, and breathing in the steam. And as I said earlier, Arabaini is the Swahili word for the number 40, and the plant is named thus because it's said that it can be used to treat 40 different diseases. 
The other thing that I want to say about um, herbal medicines is that they're not just used to treat what in medical anthropology we've kind of um, distinguished as natural illnesses. Those are distinct from the kinds of illnesses which are caused by, say, conflicts with um, other people, family members, or that are caused by supernatural causes as well. So, for example, herbal medicines can be used to protect against witchcraft. Um, and there are also substances that have qualities that are very different to pharmaceuticals. They're much more implicated in pharmaceuticals are very separate from human relationships to the extent that actually you don't need a, a doctor. You don't need a kind of like a, a healing consultation in order to use a pharmaceutical necessarily. Um, but um, with a lot of herbal medicines, there's also a personal relationship involved. So to give an example, one healer who I worked with regularly in Tanzania introduced me as a person to the plants that he used. He would first say the name of the plant, then he would tell it my name, and then he told me, told, told the plant that he was going to tell me about its properties, but that it wasn't to do its work for me should I try to use it myself, so I couldn't steal it. Um, and this has been documented by other researchers as well. So Steve Fireman has described how for Shambar healers in Tanzania, medicines are activated through the spoken word, which transforms them and gives them the capacity to cure. In this way, a healer has a social relationship with the herbs and the speech itself transforms the nature of the herbs themselves. Some healing techniques even change the relationship between the person and the medicine. It's like a blood pact that transforms the two entities. You can enter a relationship with a powerful tree or herb or exchange blood for sap so that your body is in harmony with the tree. The anthropologist Stacey Langwick also writes about this personal relationship between the healer and herbal medicine in Nuala in Tanzania. She describes how two healers might use different medicines to treat different symptoms, but the nature of the plant itself was mediated by a spirit which climbs on the healer's body when she harvests it and it transforms the body of the healer and makes it possible to turn it into a medicine. So as a result, this means that there can be mixed attitudes to call, towards kind of like commodified medicine. That's medicine that's kind of like been turned into um, substances that can be bought and sold outside of a um, outside of a kind of like a personal relationship. So on the one hand, a healer who knows your family can be seen to be more effective than um, a medicine which comes kind of like devoid of social relationships from a shop because the relationship is part of the efficacy of the medicine. But contrary to this, Susan White and another anthropologist has argued based on her research in, in Uganda that commodified or pharmaceutical type medicines are very popular precisely because they disentangle people from these relationships and often the expense, the considerable expense of time consuming rituals. So why the focus on um, herbal medicines given that they are just one of many forms of traditional medicine? So to understand this, I think we need to consider what is almost a century of disciplining traditional healers by the state. And this has defined the conditions under which they can practice and to which they must react and adapt. So we can begin with the colonial anti-witchcraft ordinances, which were in many ways a means to control traditional healers rather than to prevent witchcraft. Um, and Stephen Fireman, to go back to his work, has said that um, we need to think about and remember the role of spirit mediums and diviners as part of the history of healing. Um, and that also, all too often we think about them in terms of the history of religion. Um, and, and importantly, their, their political role as well, because some of them, they were involved with large scale threats to survival, such as epidemics and, wit and famines, with warfare and with widespread diseases of cattle and witchcraft. But they were also very important in terms of social critique. So one example of a, of a movement that was um, kind of like really um, important in terms of social critique was led, that was led by a spirit medium is the Maji Maji rebellion in Tanzania or what was then called Tanganyika, which took place between 1905 and 1907. And it was led by a spirit medium, Kinji Kitile, who claimed that he had been called to organize people to eliminate the German colonizers in southern Tanganyika. He gave his followers war medicine that was said to turn German bullets into water. The rebellion ultimately failed against the power of, of German guns and also the Germans destroyed people's crops, which caused a famine. But this rebellion led by healers, led by spirit healers, shook up the German colonizers. Um, what, what was going on obviously was a very um, like a militaristic and also magical 
um, rebellion and therefore a critique of the, um, the German colonial state. And so the German and then later the British colonizers found such resistance from um, members of um, just what, what they saw as ordinary people, that is um, people who were not chiefs or kings, they saw this kind of resistance as intolerable. Um, and um, one of the reasons that they found this intolerable is that they couldn't be co-opted in the same way that they were able to co-opt chiefs into their system of power. And so to begin with, um, the measures that they took against healers were kind of ad hoc, that sometimes they executed them or they jailed them or they exiled mediums. But then soon after came the anti-witchcraft ordinances, which really were about disciplining healers as opposed to um, managing um, witchcraft. And then it became possible to convict any African healer of witchcraft and send them to jail. But at the same time, it was well known by um, colonial officers that um, healers were the ones doing most of the health work. They were the ones providing most of the health care. And so the prosecution of healers was left to the discretion of colonial officials. They tended to prosecute only if healers were working at a community level and to leave them alone if they were just treating individuals. So what they wanted to avoid was this kind of community mobilization, which might um, end up as um, some kind of rebellion. And so the result was um, a reshaping of African healing so that the patient now became an individual rather than a community. And in this way, the practice of a healer started to resemble the private clinic of a European doctor. And so the anti-witchcraft ordinances at this stage were about undermining the sources of resistance that were led by traditional healers. Spirit mediums and other ritual authorities were persecuted in the colonial period because they had an autonomous position from which to criticize the social order and because they were convincing enough in their critiques to move people to action. So fast forward to early, the period, early period of um, after independence in the 1970s. Um, when we start to see a broader movement to professionalize African healers. Um, a really great book has been written by Travanduka Tra and, and, and Mary Last um, um, about um, the professionalization of um, African healers in, in across African countries. But I'm gonna draw on um, Stacey Langwitz's work who's written about how in the early 1970s, traditional medicine was supported in Tanzania after a symposium on African medicinal plants, which was held in Senegal in 1968. The idea was to take indigenous knowledge about plants and transform that knowledge through scientific investigation. As a consequence, there was a shift towards funding, researching and legalizing certain forms of traditional medicine. The focus was on commodifying indigenous medicine and by recasting plant material as a resource as a, of, of an indigenous pharmaceutical in industry, traditional medicine held out the promise of a greater economic independence. And this move was also influenced by Tanzania's relationship with China at the time in the context of Tanzania's socialism. Uh, China had been integrating Chinese medicine and biomedicine for the use of, of barefoot doctors and Tanzania was very influenced by this. And so the National Union of Traditional Healers was formed in 1971 under the Ministry of Culture as an attempt to organize and professionalize healers. But then it was almost immediately banned because of mismanagement and fears about witchcraft. And then in 1974, the Institute of Traditional Medicine was formed at Muhumbili Hospital in 19, um, and this focused on the investigation of, of herbal medicines. They interviewed healers, they collected samples, but the healers were treated as informants rather than being seen as experts in their own rights. Then moving forward to the 1990s, you begin to see a period um, in the kind of like the, the aftermath of structural adjustment when, when the World Health Organization and the World Bank start to encourage um, uh, countries in the global south to draw on their traditional medical, medical systems. And so traditional medicine then moved from being a strategy for national and pan-African self-reliance to being part of Tanzania's strategy to manage the impacts of structural impact, um, adjustment programs while striving to meet its health development goals. So the idea was is that by drawing on locally produced herbal medicine and incorporating the um, non-biomedical non therapies into um, the, the, the health system in Tanzania, then they might be able to meet some of the health development goals. And then 
this is kind of like when my, the, the, I'm now moving on to the period of time when my own research comes onto the scene. Um, when I was doing field work in Keller, a district of Tanzania, between um, in, during the first period of my research there between 2000 and 2002, it was a time um, kind of the really the peak of the um, the HIV and AIDS um, pandemic. And there was not much that the go local government run health service could do to help people who had HIV and AIDS. There were no antiretrovirals available at that stage. And if somebody got a diagnosis that they were HIV positive, then all that could be done was to try and treat the associated, associated opportunistic infections. If you were HIV positive, then you might get painkillers such as paracetamol, you might get antibiotics and antifungal treatments, Occasionally you would be admitted to hospital and get treatment for dehydration, but most of the time people were sent home and told that there was nothing that could be done for them. And so as a result, people with HIV would seek other sources of care and frequently turn to traditional healers. My research at the time was focused on malaria, which the healers I worked with were interested in, but it didn't concern them as much as they were interested in HIV. The inability of biomedicine to treat HIV meant that they were getting a lot of patients who they suspected or knew were HIV positive or had even progressed to AIDS. But the healers I spoke to at the time were scared, um, quite reasonably, and they were very preoccupied with this pandemic because they were at the forefront of dealing with it. Um, they were afraid of both cross-infecting their patients, for example, by reusing the razors that are used to administer, um, to be uh, used to cut the skin in order to insert some herbal medicines, but also being infected themselves. They wanted to be provided with plastic disposable gloves. The midwives in particular were afraid of being infected by a woman's glove when they were intending a, a childbirth. And they wanted training to learn more about HIV, AIDS, infection and control. I think the other notable thing about from this period is that it was a time when Tanzanians really started taking interest in food as medicine as well. So um, a lot of people um, said that eating pork was a, um, a cure for HIV. So if we remember at the time, people's bodies became very, very thin and eating pork, a very fatty meat is associated with putting on weight. So people would um, eat pork. Um, they also, um, I think this came from South Africa. Um, people took aloe vera, which was um, reputed to have um, kind of like immunological properties. And then later when antiretrovirals did become available, then food also became an important part of um, the training that the hospital gave to people on how to take these medicines. Going back to the traditional healers, they were also keen to have access to the resources, the equipment and expertise that would permit them to produce tablets from their herbal medicines. This they hoped would allow them to administer more accurate doses and would mean that the medicines wouldn't go off so quickly um, and thus avoiding an arduous trip to the mountains or to the bush to collect more of them. They were aware that the Traditional and Alternative Medicines Act of 2002 was coming and they were keen to emphasize to me the very many ways that they practiced responsibly. Part of this was a very clear articulation against witchcraft and the role that they felt that they had in combating it. They were also suspicious of the Institute for Traditional Medicine, which they feared was more interested in making a profit from their knowledge than it was in supporting them as healers. Then in 2002, um, the uh, Traditional and Alternative Medicines Act was implemented, and this involved a move of traditional medicine from the Ministry of Culture to the Ministry of Health, the registration of traditional healers, the organization of a national association, the, re the regulation of witchcraft practices, the establishment of regulatory controls for the investigation of herbal medicine and the criteria for the self-practice of alternative medicine. And the aim, according to Sabina Mnaliwa, a leading figure in the institutionalization of traditional medicine and who had trained in China, had been assigned and had been assigned the task of developing the new legislation. She said that her main aim, as far as she was concerned, was to remove the idea that visiting an, a healer was an illegal practice, that is, she wanted to take away the stigma. And so the outcome of that was that some forms of traditional medicine, in particular herbal medicines, were encouraged, but others, such as ritual healing, anti witchcraft medication, spirit divinations, were either not encouraged, but, uh, but also at particular points in time were condemned. So I'm sure you're all aware of um, the fact that in the 2000s um, in Tanzania, 
There were multiple cases of people with albinism being murdered for their body parts, which were reported to being used in medicines used to generate wealth, particularly in parts of the country where there was mining. And this kind of medicine was said to bring luck in mining and rumor had it that it was some of the most powerful businessmen and politicians who were buying it. And in response to the growing national and international scandal in January 2009, the prime minister, Mizengo Pinda, banned the practice of traditional medicine. And this was followed by arrests and charges, some of whom were given the death sentence. A similar sequence of events followed in 2015 when witch doctors were banned again. This time, you see, traditional medicine was equated with witch doctors, a pejorative and misleading term, which implies that healers are witches who wish to cause harm. And there might be, there may well be a minority, in fact, there clearly were because of the murders, a minority of healers who carry out this kind of criminal practice. But there are also many others whose knowledge of witchcraft is understood to be used to protect people against witches, an aim that they share with many of the different denominations of churches in the country. So the anthropologist Amy Nichols Bellow has written about how this has led to further biomedicalization of traditional healers. Um, she works in Wanza um, in Tanzania. Um, and those who deal with magical and spiritual practices have been driven underground, and some of their work has instead been taken up by evangelical churches. She's found that women healers in particular have been negatively affected because few of them have sufficient literacy and the formal education necessary to be able to meet government demands for formal registration as a healer. And the renewed criminalization of traditional medicine has also changed the shape of, of medicine in Wanza at least, um, with a clear move towards healers practicing in clinics that resemble biomedical facilities. Amy Nichols Bello noted that because religious healing, which falls under the Ministry of Culture, is still permitted to take place, then Islamic traditional healers were able to continue to practice, as were preachers who would lay on hands to treat a range of ailments from cancer to de demonic possession. So we can see from this very condensed history that the response to COVID-19 by the late President Magafuli is just the latest turn in a much longer story. So to conclude, there's been a long process of disciplining traditional medicine, from the political agitators who were banned during the, only during the early colonial period, to the derogation of healers who attend to forms of magical harm, and the support of state-sponsored herbal medicine has taken place. State-sponsored herbal medicine is not necessarily good news for traditional healers. It depends very much on how they are positioned. Some are likely to gain and others are likely to lose. Those who are able to get the formal education and the capital to set themselves up as biomedical style clinics are likely to prosper. But this isn't easy. The healers who I worked with in the early 2000s made it very clearly, clear to me that they wanted access to this scientific knowledge and equipment, but it wasn't forthcoming. And those who cannot do this or who specialize in a form of medicine that intervenes in the sphere of the supernatural are likely to have to go underground to stop practicing or shift to the relig religious sphere. There is also the question of the status of herbal medicines as a substance that can be understood through a biomedical lens as having either an active ingredient that can be tested during scientific methods, methods such as randomized controlled trials or thinking of herbs as plants with which healers and patients have personal relationships, sometimes mediated by spirits, and which the relationship itself is considered to be necessary for the plant's efficacy as a medicine. So in thinking about traditional medicine and COVID-19, we can also draw lessons from the turn of the last century when traditional healers were dealing with the HIV and AIDS pandemic at a time when antiretroviral therapy was only accessible to the wealthy and well-connected and they were largely unsupported by the state. They needed PPE, they needed training, and they also wished for a respectful relationship with practitioners of biomedicine in which their knowledge could be taken into account rather than being treated as entrepreneurial barefoot doctors. And we can remember also that using Miti Shamba or herbal medicine, as was advocated by Magafuli, is not an extraordinary state of affairs. Rather, it is an everyday experience for many ordinary Tanzanians when appropriate biomedical pharmaceuticals are not available. So um, just to sum up, there seems to be an irony in the turn towards traditional medicine as a critique of the Imperial Global North and its failure to distribute essential pharmaceuticals. The traditional medicine that is advocated is one that has been cleansed of its now long dead political activism and has instead been shaped to and conforms to and to be co-opted and is co-opted by 
a marketized form of traditional indigenous biomedicine in such a way that it's unlikely to benefit the majority of the original owners of indigenous knowledge, many of the healers themselves. And I shall end there. Thank you. Thank you so very much for that very insightful presentation. I am also very, very um, excited with your approach, especially how you give us a very broad historical background to the kinds of issues we're discussing here. And also how you solve, how you try to correct so many misconceptions about how we look at traditional medicine, especially your position about how some of us think Magufuli um, by providing state support to traditional or to Haba Yili was doing actually, was doing a new thing or a good thing. I think the way you conceptualize it to show us that this was an everyday affair in Tanzania is very, very instructive to the kinds of discussions we have here today. Thank you so very much for that presentation. We enjoyed it. And um, before I open the platform for everyone to ask questions, um, I will engage you um, on one or two points. I am I'm very interested in the way you look at um, states control, especially when you brought it from the archive, the colonial period, how you looked at state control and the intention, first the intention of the colonial government in the 19, in the early 20th century, then down to the 1970s, down to the 1990s, and to your own context during um, the malaria epidemic in Tanzania. Very, very instructive. Now, what I want to understand is how do we fix that into a global health discourse? Do you think there is a way to look at the contribution of the WHO to popularizing or depopularizing traditional medicine on the continent? And I don't know if you're familiar with the issue in Madagascar that happened last year. Maybe you have one or two comments about that. But well, I just want to understand how you can fix that discourse into a global health context. That's number one. And also number two, I also want to talk about the old crisis around authenticating traditional medicine. Um, with your experience on the feed, I, I like the, the scenario you shared with us about that healer that took you to a particular plant and I called your name, called the name of the, of the healer and the name of the plant and that kind of social relationship between the healer, the patient and the herb. I like that kind of context. Now I want to understand, how do we then authenticate good and bad medicine um, in, within the context of the difference in authentication? Because for a traditional healer, a good medicine means something different. For a biomedical practitioner who has the enormous support of the state and the enormous support of global health institutions, he sees a good medicine as any medicine that follows the laid down procedures. So I want to understand um, the old issues you encountered on the field as regards of education. Were those healers trying to, were they swayed by, um, state forces to get authentication outside um, the outside their epistemic network. I mean, outside traditional medicine, where they swayed to get authentication, maybe by taking their herbs to the laboratories. And what kinds of problems do they face with that kind of process? And if they face that kind of problem, just like I said, if it's possible, you link that to the COVID nineteen organic. Is it possible that with COVID-19 organic, the problem they also faced was a problem of authentication and not a problem of viability. So those are the two questions I would like you to provide insight to before I, I open the platform for other questions. Thanks. Thank you so much. Before, be, sorry, before I answer the question, can you just tell me more about the situation in Madagascar? Because I don't know enough about it to answer your question properly. You remember um, last year when um, when the, the pandemic started, you remember last year, the Madagascar mm -hmm. government came, came up with, with a, a remedy, which they okay. called um, the Madagascar COVID organic and, and there was a whole lot of controversy outside there. 
then we 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 got um governments in on the continent some governments approving and some governments disapproving i think the nigerian government for instance got a shipment of that of the organic for testing and i i don't know if they approved it subsequently but i remember the who did not did not approve the I think in the COVID-19 organic. And my position when I heard that was that the problem of authentication in the sense that you are trying to use, perhaps maybe you are trying to use biomedicine to authenticate um, a practice, a, an age long practice among the people. And, and I expected what I call an epistemic crisis in that mm -hmm. sense. So I just want you to, uh, and we have we have a professor from Madagascar in the next section, so I'm very sure he will give us a very um, deep context to that. Yeah, I will listen to his um, his lecture with a lot of interest. Thank you for um, explaining that to me. So, um, yeah, I mean, I, I I agree with your interpretation that there's a um, there's an epistemological difference between um, the um the kind of medicine that the who is willing to approve and the kind of medicine which um which is used by um a lot of traditional healers um and um yeah i think it's it's interesting that on the one hand we have um efforts um by for example the tanzanian state but also um you can see this happening and has happened in china and also in india um in which um, herbal medicines are investigated um, scientifically, um, and um, but but they're always investigated using the knowledge frameworks that come from biomedicine. So so traditional medicine is never investigated on its own terms; it has to um, conform. So and I think I think um, one of the um, one of the issues that the traditional healers often um, raised with me was the, um, the the inequality in the exchange. What they um, what 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 they wanted was was to have their knowledge taken seriously, rather than them being kind of converted into sort of um, I suppose like second best agents for biomedicine. So where biomedicine can't reach, then traditional medicine would step in. Um, so um, I, I think, um, and, and so in terms of, of, of state control, I think state control has very much been um, determined to, um, to, to fit traditional medicine and kind of like to, to um, almost kind of purify it into such a state that it actually, it, it conforms and becomes closer to biomedicine so that it can be respected. Um, so that's that. I hope that answers your first question. And then, in terms of identifying good and bad medicine, I mean, it's all, it's, it's a pretty similar question, really. Um, the um, but I think perhaps one difference is that um, we're coming into when I was describing the relationship between the plant and the healer. I suppose one area that I was starting to get into is the um, the area of symbolic healing and ritual healing which tends to be um, viewed as, as if it's um, only relevant to traditional um, medicine um, or indigenous forms of, of medicine. Um, and with commodified um, herbs or um, pharmaceuticals, then what happens is that the, um, the human relationship is taken out of it, which can be an important form part of the healing process. Um, but um, one thing that we can also remember, I think, is that actually um, symbolic healing is um, not limited to herbal medicines as well. So um, it's been shown, for example, that with some um, pharmaceutical medicines, their efficacy um, is, um, is affected by the symbolism which is associated with the form in which they're um, produced. So to give you a, a what's a I think it's probably going to be quite a memorable example. The, um, the pharmaceutical Viagra um, is, um, I expect, um, expect you're aware, is, is, is produced in a blue tablet, um, except in Italy, where it's orange. Um, and the reason for that is that um, 
Viagra is usually more effective when it's blue. Um, and that is because the, um, the, the symbolic power of Viagra, um, the, the hypothesis is, is that it's because um, blue is associated with kind of blue movies and the relationship between Viagra and sexuality. But in um, Italy, it doesn't work that well because blue is associated with the Virgin Mary. And so therefore in Italy, Viagra is produced in orange. So um, where am I going with this? Um, I think um, I think it's probably important to have some kind of symmetry between um, the way that we um, think about how um, biomedicine and traditional medicine is evaluated, um, and to um, remember that both have active ingredients, but both also kind of like depend on um, ritual or symbolic power and uses as well. Thank you very much. Um... So I think now I should open the floor for, for more questions. Um, okay, maybe I should start with Prof. I can see Prof's and yeah. Yeah, uh, thanks Rebecca. Um, great, great stuff. I'm really impressed and thank you once again. Um, may, may, at the risk of being unfair, I think this could be a question that either of the presenters could perhaps try to ask if the answer if they want to. Uh, I wish I could have asked it towards the end. But um, um, what do you think about this? Do you think that uh, African herbal medicines should be mainstreamed? or not? Do you think they should be mainstreamed or not? Uh, how, if you think they can be mainstreamed, how? Mm -hmm. um, um, should they also be patented? Should these African herbal medicines also be patented? Um, maybe connected to that, uh, 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 colleagues, I would ask um, uh, Rebecca, you're obviously uh, <clears throat> most probably familiar with uh, 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 Komarov's uh, book, Ethnicity Inc, A Ethnicity mm -hmm. Inc, or Ethnicity Incorporated. Um, what would be your, your, your take on uh, his, uh, his, his day? about the commercialization of ethnicity, particularly as far as the debate on the land and their huge debate on herbal medicine anywhere, almost, at least on that part. He does, of course, bring in other examples, but these are kinds of things in corporations and the taking uh, the, the, the land issue and stuff like that, but forget about it. There is an issue about the ELO and the, uh, 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 the, the argument that they do have, need to have some kind of patent over that and so on. I wonder what your thoughts will be, and that could feed into my first two questions, really. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. Um, you, you, you cut out a little bit when you were asking me about the Komarov's book in Ethnicity Inc, but I think I got the gist of the question. So, um, so first of all, should African herbal medicines, should they be mainstreamed and how? Um, so I think, I think, first of all, I do, I, I, I do think there's value in um, recognising um, and respecting the kind of um, knowledge which has come from um, African indigenous medicine. Um, and I think particularly, I think, and I think one of the reasons why um, that matters is because of the, um, I guess, the kind of like the sort of a, a global inequality when it comes to um, expertise and who is qualified to know and who isn't qualified to know. Um, and um, and I think that you know that we we need to and and and. And perhaps when you ask if her African herbal medicine should be mainstreamed or not, I also wonder if it isn't already mainstreamed in, um, in, in many contexts, because um, certainly in, um, um, in, in, in many countries, I think a lot of people do use 
herbal medicines as a um, as a matter of course. Um, so, so, so yes, I think um, I think I would say that that African herbal medicine um, should be mainstreamed. But I would also say I think I would um, I would um, go for a um, a pluralistic um, answer, and um, and I, I I would not advocate African herbal medicines being mainstreamed. Um, if that meant um, withdrawing from the benefits that come from biomedicine. So, you know, I do think that there's a global inequality which has come with the distribution of the vaccine for COVID, for example. Um, and we saw it also with the distribution of antiretrovirals for HIV and many people died because of that. Um, and so um, I think um, access to all medicines um, so that people can have an informed choice around um, what medicines are available to them um, would be um, a good route to go down. Um, in terms of um, Komarov and the Ethnicity Inc. Um, so I think, was it Hoodier that they were writing about? Is that correct? Um, and, um, and certainly, I mean, there's the question of biopiracy and the ownership of indigenous knowledge. And I think that's really important. And that was one of the things that I was wanting to get at in my talk was that um, one of the kind of like the um, things which has happened um, with the, um, the state disciplining of traditional medicine in Tanzania means that um, the ownership of medicine is potentially being taken into the arms of the state or scientists who work for the state rather than the, um, the owners of the indigenous knowledge who may have got that from um, ancestors or relationships with spirits in the first place who then um, don't get to benefit financially from it. So I do think it is important that um, that knowledge is, um, is uh, recognized um, and um, that people get people that people get money for it. Um, you know, if it's going to be commodified, then they should benefit from it financially. Um, how you do that, I'm not an expertise in, I have no little expertise in, um, in um, IP. So, um, and I would imagine it's a very complicated situation because um, it's a question of can, can one individual own um, a plant in that sense when, for example, I mean, Maobaini plant, for example, is a great example because um, everybody in Tanzania knows about the Maobaini plant. So if um, somebody patented it and sold it for a profit, then surely the citizens of Tanzania would be losing out as a consequence of that. But then also you may have healers um, working in um, areas of, of who, who, who might share the same knowledge about the same plant. So why would one manage to kind of like patent the plant and not another one? So I think it's a very complicated legal question that I definitely don't have the expertise to kind of like give you an answer to. Thank you, thank you so much. Um, I think um, there is someone here, um, Musa, uh, Musa Quantana, who wants to ask a question. Um, maybe yeah, I should I can just- I see two questions in the chat. Yes, yes. Maybe you should just uh, provide an answer. Okay. Yes, number one is asking, um, why when it's, okay, when is our African medication? Okay, he's, he's asking about um, the connection between African medicine and witchcraft, and he's thinking that why why do you in what context do you discuss this relationship? This relationship, and that's the first question. The second question is, what is the objective of your project, and what is the solution, and what is the solution for for Africa? What is your point regarding vaccine for COVID-19 and the medical, medicalization of COVID-19 in Madagascar? What is the way forward as Africa because the COVID-19 is still active? And what is your solution? So I think the second question is just, um, I think you've answered some of them already, but maybe you just want to say one or two things about the viability of traditional medicine um, during this um, pandemic. Mm -hmm. I'll take the first question first, which is, um, you know, why, why do we have to talk about witchcraft when we're talking about traditional uh, African medicine? And I think that's a, that's a, that's a, that's a very good and, and important question, um, not least because um, um, I think talking about witchcraft 
in the context of traditional medicine can be very stigmatizing. And certainly that wasn't kind of my intention to, to, to do that. Um, because, um, and, in, and indeed, I think um, one of the effects of this, um, the, I mean, it, it, it's, it's, it's um, certainly when I, I guess, kind of like to, to backtrack a bit, I think, I think one of the reasons why, why, why I was talking about it is because it is a, um, a component of the wide range of um, different forms of practices of um, traditional medicine as I came across it in Tanzania. And it was also um, of concern, witchcraft was of concern to the people who I, who I did my research with. Um, so people would be asking questions about whether they had HIV or whether they had um, been bewitched um, or um, they, um, there were concerns about the numbers of people dying and was that um, due to um, like a form of community witchcraft, which I've written about elsewhere, but I won't go into great detail. But the, I, think, I think the reason why I talked about it is because it, was, it mattered to the people who I was doing my research with. Um, and um, and people turned to traditional medicine to deal with that. They couldn't um, go to buy a medicine if they were worried about um, about witchcraft. Sorry, my, um, so so I think I think that's that's one of the reasons why I think it's important to address it because it's 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 there. It exists, um, and um, it has been one of the reasons why I think um, African forms of medication have been stigmatized because it's out there. But I think it's also to, uh, important to understand that um, most um, traditional medical practitioners do not practice witchcraft. They, um, they want to protect people against it, but they don't um, wish to, um, to, to practice it themselves. So um, some of the stigmatization which goes on, I think is a misnomer. Um, and then the, 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 the second question, what is the objective of my project and what is the solution that can help um, Africans and what's my point of view regarding vaccine for COVID-19 and the medication of COVID-19 in Madagascar and what's the way forward for Africa because the COVID-19 is still active and what is my solution? Well, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm just one anthropologist. I don't have a solution which can, can um, to, well, I mean, if I if I had a if I had a solution, it would be the global redistribution of capital, um, and um, to make sure that um, that uh, vaccinations were available to, um, to fairly to everybody in the world, rather than just a few members in um, in in um, high income countries like um, like Scotland. Um, so that would be my solution, but it's a fairly unrealistic solution because um, it would re require a major um, um, political change. Um, so, um, and the way forward, um, I, I, the way forward in Africa, because COVID-19 is, is, is still active, um, I think there's value in um, continuing to look for um, traditional medicine as a potential answer, but I also think it's important to, um, to continue to campaign a bit like treatment action campaign, um, pushed to make sure that people had access to antiretrovirals in the early 2000s and the late 1990s and to do something similar for COVID. And in fact, I see on the Treatment Action Campaign website that they are also pushing for um, vaccines. So I think a kind of like a two, you know, two pronged attack um, would be important. And, oh, and a third thing as well, I think we also need to remember that COVID-19 um, certainly as it has taken place here in the UK is a disease of poverty. Um, and um, we also really need to remember the structural determinants of health and remember kind of like who is made um, more vulnerable to a disease, um, which, um, for example, can be spread through um, poor living conditions or um, people not being able to self-isolate um, at, a, at a time when the, um, there's a major wave of infection going on. Thank you very much. Um, so we have a few other questions. So let me just pick on, on one. Uh, there's a comment from Prof. He said, if he is, this is a crisis, um, communal knowledge versus capitalism. Mm -hmm. And if he is, we are stuck somewhere. So maybe you want to comment on that. Then also there's a question. Why do you think African traditional medicines need to be patented? 
what would this mean for the majority of African people who are already struggling with the commoditization of the commons? Mm -hmm. So, so I think it's a follow up to or a response to Prof's earlier question. Do you have one or two things to say uh, regarding this? Yeah, I mean, just to take the question on patents, I don't, I don't think um, any anybody's said they should be patented, um, but um, I think what um, I think, I think, I think what is important is that the people who who um, own the knowledge around um, traditional medicine should benefit from any um, financial profit which comes from them. Um, and I think yes, there is a um, a real question around the commoditization of the commons, and I think that requires a legal response. Um, so um, I do think that um, if there's kind of like community um, ownership of particular knowledge, then the community should benefit from it, as opposed to just a um, an individual. And then the um, the question of the um, communal knowledge versus capitalism, yeah, it does imply that we need a different kind of financial model. Um, I don't think I've got the answer to that, um, but um, I do think that um, clearly a kind of like a capitalistic model um, is not working, it's only working for one part of the, the world, um, and so that kind of, you know, that ownership of knowledge by particular, or, or, or of medicines by particular companies who can profit from them, um, at the expense of um, individuals who, who can't or can't get access to them is, um, it's not sustainable. Maybe the global north will start to understand that actually this puts them at risk as well, and they will start to act accordingly. But I don't feel particularly optimistic about that. Thank, thank you so very much. Um, I think we've come to the end of this session. Um, I do want to appreciate you for um, providing very this very Please. important um, answers to to our Please. questions. Okay. Okay, Prof. Uh, thank you very much. Thank, thank you very you. much, Tamula. Uh, thank you very much, yeah. uh, Rebecca, yeah. for uh, your interesting uh, uh, presentation. Uh, I would like uh, to put uh, just two questions. Uh, my first question is, uh, I'll talk about uh, CVO uh, later. Huh? My, mm -hmm. my first question is, uh, do you think that uh, all kind of disease could be treated with uh, traditional medicine? Do, do, you think that, uh, do, you, do you think that uh, all kind of diseases could be treated with uh, traditional medicine? Mm -hmm. And the second question is, uh, if a traditional healer claims, for example, 40 diseases for one plant, what is your reaction? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I love the second Thank question. You so, much. <laughs> so um, okay. So do I think that any diseases could be treated with traditional medicine? Well, yes, I do because they are. Um, so if we um, if we look at, um, I mean, if we, if 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 we take the standards of biomedicine, um, which is sort of like the, the least controversial um, approach, then we can al already see that herb certain herbal medicines are very successfully being used to treat um, diseases. So we had quinine with malaria, we now have artemisinin um, with malaria, we had um, aspirin as well, which came from the bark of the willow tree. These are all widely used um, globalized um, medicines, which came from herbal medicines. Um, other kinds of diseases, um, um, which could respond to um, kind of social healing as well. Um, so, I mean, again, another very uncontroversial example I would say would be mental health, um, through which ritual healing or symbolic healing of some sort of is, 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 has some kind of efficacy. So, um, I think I think those would be two examples of where um, certain diseases can be treated with traditional medicine. Um, if a traditional healer claims 40 diseases for one drug, what is my response? But I mean, interestingly, a lot of people in Tanzania, I, I, mean, I don't know whether they believe it or not, but the, the, the plant, Arabaini, um, 
certainly um, is it, 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 it gains its name because people say it can be used to treat 40 diseases. So it's not just a healer who's saying that, it's kind of like the, the general public who are saying that. Um, I guess my gut instinct is to doubt it. But then on the other hand, if you looked at um, the number of um, at least symptoms that something like um, aspirin or paracetamol, you know, the, the, the number of diseases which they're applied to, um, then I, I, yeah, it would be interesting to see how many um, you could um, identify if you um, used it for those things. I think, I think the thing is, is that albine is probably used to treat symptoms rather than disease. And I think that's an important distinction to make. And I think it's certainly one which most Tanzanians would make. Having said that, a lot of healers do make claims to be able to treat a kind of like a multiple set of diseases. And in fact, somewhere in my office, I'm not quite sure where it is, I've just moved no, I can't find it. So there's a, um, a, um, a, a medicine that was being commodified in Tanzania called Ngetwa. Um, and inside it, it was sold in a kind of like a, a packet and it had freeze dried, dried herbs inside it. And certainly the list of diseases which it was said to treat um, probably numbered about 40. I haven't counted them, but there were a lot of diseases. Um, I tend to be kind of a bit skeptical about that, but um, but maybe that's because um, I've been socialized in a society where on the whole, we tend to think of diseases and one disease, one medicine. So I would be open minded. Well, I, I, I actually like that, that answer. And the last bit, um, you've been socialized in a society where you think one medicine is made for um, one disease. I think that's a very good context. Um, thank you so much, Rebecca, for providing this very deep and insightful context. Um, I think this is one way to launch to launch the, 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 the symposium, and it's very, very interesting. Um, yeah, we want to say thank you to you, and we hope to have you talk to us uh, whenever we want to go on to discuss issues related to anthropology of traditional medicine and also yes before you round up i think i i also want you to <laughs> yes you still have like three minutes can you tell us one or two things about what you mean by modernizing traditional medicine and maybe okay. you can just give us insight into okay, what you're of course. So, so you're referring to an article that i wrote about 10 years ago called the modern traditional healer um, and in that, what I was interested in is, um, I've been using the, the word traditional healer uncritically all the way through my talk today, because I didn't want to kind of like get into um, the, the, the debate about the term, but um, on the whole tradition, and I don't think tradition in a way would really have existed without modernity, without, without um, I think probably without collect without missions and, um, and colonizers coming along and saying that actually we're bringing modernity and you have tradition um, and, um, and then tradition itself becomes um, stigmatized and seen as backward and undeveloped. Um, and one of the things that I wanted to get across in that paper was actually tradition is not something which stays in the past if we're going to call it tradition. Um, and I think it's a problem to call it that. Um, but I haven't come up with a better word for it. So I guess that's why I stick with it, but I'll often put it in quotes. Um, but actually it's something which changes, which moves with the time, which engages with um, contemporary debates and discussions. And that, certainly that's something that you're doing, I assume you're trying to um, do in the symposium today. Does that help? I hope that's an answer. Great. Perfect answer. Thank you so much. We enjoyed this session. Now we are moving to the next session immediately. Um, I will hand over to my colleague, um, Alain Rene de Falaromi and uh, Dr. George Bichet. Uh, so uh, we will introduce the next section. Thank, thank you. Um, hello, everyone. I am Alain Rene de Falaromi Flourish and um, I'll be co-sharing this panel with Dr. Bishi George. Uh, before moving straight to the panelists, which we have today, I would want to first of all go straight to the ground roots. 
Uh, each panel, each panelist is going to speak for 40 minutes. Thereafter, we we'll go to the question and answer session. Uh, before introducing the first uh, speaker for us this afternoon, I would want to sincerely welcome every one of us to this uh, session. And uh, I am very positive that this session is going to be one of the most interesting ones so far since this um, program. However, I, um, Professor Misindo has actually done us uh, justice by giving us a citation of both um, panelists. So I would quickly want to uh, invite the first speaker, Professor David, uh, to uh, give us his presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Folani, uh, for the floor. Uh, I'd like to use uh, some PowerPoint presentation. Uh, is, it, uh, is it possible for you to activate my presentation? I would like to use uh, some uh, PowerPoint uh, presentation. Is yeah, it possible? You can, share. you can share from your screen and we'll get it from our head. Can you see my presentation? Yeah, yeah, we can. It's on. Uh, firstly, uh, I would like to thank to thank you, uh, the organizer, for choosing me among your guests today. Thank you for your trust. Then I would like to apologize for my English level and also for not having prepared my presentation in a more professional manner for several reasons, among other problem of time. We have just retake the pedagogic activities at the university and uh, it was only Wednesday that uh, I learned about uh, the program for our meeting that my presentation last 40 minutes, it will be shorter and simpler. I have uh, given as a title of my intervention, uh, this question, what to do before the vaccine arrive? We had to adapt with what we have at our disposal. What is the reality? Humanity has first a new disease, COVID-19. It is difficult to claim traditional medicine in the case of a new disease. It is true that uh, infectious disease linked to the coronavirus already existed, but they did not reach this pandemic scale. All government have panicked and have taken what they think is right about the epidemic. Knowledge about the disease was very low. The center is China, and we know how the Chinese government handled the situation. There was a sort of uh, withholding of information, but what must be said, despite the fact that they were the ones who had the first case, the impact of the disease in China is less heavy than in other countries. The other countries have not been able to learn lessons about the contagious, contagiousness and the level of uh, virulence of uh, the disease. The virus arrived in Africa in late of February 
early March uh, on uh, 2020. WHO has predicted health disaster for Africa because of poverty, lack of infrastructure, and scarce human resources, way of life, etc. The African population in general has each one habit for each health care. But uh, I can't only speak of the case of Madagascar. But today, officially, there have been 4,200 confirmed cases with uh, 8,874 uh, deaths. I'm specifying official state statistics, but uh, we all know, for example, the rectification brought by the Colombian government, which is, I personally find very courageous as a decision. The, the reality is uh, almost three times what they communicated. Even European government dubbed the undeclared case, death at home or in the hospice. We know the reservoir of the coronavirus is the pet. In Madagascar, especially in uh, the bus, we almost live with uh, this animal. So immunization against uh, the animal disease is not a hypothesis that we cannot rule out. Secondly, we have a staple diet that is mostly plant-based. We eat, for example, leaves of taro, cassava, sweet potatoes, leaves of certain wild plant, and uh, this is almost daily. So we take advantage of the molecular chemical uh, wealth of this plant. Their medicinal effects are not negligible. Thirdly, what should not be forgotten is that uh, the rate of uh, self healing self -helping of uh, this uh, COVID-19 disease is high, over than uh, 85%, especially among young people. The African people is young. The level of the defense system is in young people is much higher than that of the elderly. The Malagasy have a strong habit uh, of treating respiratory diseases by fumigation or by inhaling essential oil. I remember the soaring price of uh, aromatic plant on the market as soon as the diseases was announced. The leaves of cinnamon mom camphora in my garden have been torn off. The neighbor had to come to me to ask for it. During this pandemic, all essential oil reaching uh, one and uh, yet senior oil is very, like, uh, very, very uh, used. Like cinnamon mom camphora, cinnamon fragrance, and the uh, eucalyptus citriodora. The Malagasy Ministry of Health has designed a protocol based on hydroxychloroquine and azithromycin with a strict ban on anti-inflammatory drug at the start, which has evolved over time and has knowledge on the pathophysiology advance and uh, is much more precise. We at IMRA, Institute of uh, Applied, uh, Malagasy Institute of Applied Research, when COVID is officially de declared and the main clinical information is uh, a viral disease in the resp respiratory tract, we have selected the phytomedicine acting on the on this system 
they have been mixed into one form, but the disease is infectious. And since there was no possible preventive treatment other than vitamin C, we thought that uh, plant rich in uh, flavonoids are needed to support the human defense. Of course, non specific, not like the vaccine. It is the objective which, explain the, which explains the introdu introduction of uh, Artemisia annua in the first formulation. And uh, it uh, gives the CVO. Some available data have reported the therapeutic effect of this plant caused by SRAS-CoV-1 and uh, MERS-CoV. Artemisinin has, artemisinin has an antiviral activity and each flavonoid component not only improve the pharmacokinetics uh, profile of artemisinin, but also known for their antioxidant and the immunostimulating activity. COVID is fatal in each com complication stage, which is secondary to the inflammatory stage. These complications are the consequence of uh, inadequacy of the inflammatory response of our organism. As we know, we assist a cytokine storm and uh, an overproduction of reactive oxygen species which are in the origin of a complication stage. Now, we know that uh, physiopathologically, COVID-19 presents three stages, viral stage, inflammatory stage, and the uh, attack system, including vasculitis. To have an uh, adequate inflammatory response, Anti-inflammatory drugs should be contraindicated during viral stage. It is simply necessary to control the viral proliferation. If a disease is rich with inflammatory stage, this is where anti-inflammatory drugs are needed. The problem is how to know exactly that you are in the inflammatory stage and that the two stages can overlap. In my very personal opinion, with this heart of self-healing, it is not easy to, to statistically prove the effectiveness of a protocol, unless we can categorize patients according to their clinical condition, their age, and perhaps their gender. The results of almost all clinical trials are not conclusive and do not provide a reliable treatment protocol. Hence, the need for vaccine is urgently. Uh, that means, Mr. Tatunk, that means thank you very much for uh, your attention. Thank you, Prof. Uh, thank you very much, Professor David, for your huh? presentation. Nice. We finished before time, but um, we'll quickly go to Reverend uh, Ashley Adodo to give us his presentation before we go to the question and answer um, session. Yeah. So, uh, Reverend, I have finished. Adodo, we're, yeah. Thank you so much for your presentation. Yeah, thank you. Reverend Adodo. Thank you. Uh, yeah, sorry, yes, I'll be ready in two minutes, please. What happens?
Oh, can I ask a question in the interim while uh, Rev Reverend Adodo is preparing? What is? Uh, uh, my question is, uh -huh. uh, how does one tell what stage of the virus he or she is in? Can one tell it or is it something that will just be uh, predicted or told, one can be told by the hospital, by the medical experts? Please, someone can uh, translate the, the question in French, please. Ah. Someone can translate it in French, please. It's, it's quite very unfortunate that we don't have a French as translator, but uh, Prof, can you kindly come uh, uh, repeat your question and take it very slowly so that I can possibly get what you're asking? Excuse me. Yeah, okay. Um, I, will, I, I, will, I will ask it. Let me just go. I will go to a system and somewhere and I will get a kind of a French translation and I'll come with that. I will type it and put it here. That's, that's in order. I apologize. Okay. I think that's that should work. Um, why Prof tries to translate uh, for you to uh, understand this question, there's also a question already pending here and I want to read it to you and uh, possibly get a response to the question. The question is from Musa Kwekana and is asking, is interested in knowing uh, about the disaster of uh, WHO? What is your plan and solution in relation to the COVID-19 um, um, organic? Uh, about uh, CVO? Uh, COVID organics, uh, there is uh, there is a scientific region. I have explained uh, already the scientific region. We have mixed uh, some fetal medicine acting on the uh, respiratory system. And uh, we have introduced after of the uh, Artemisia annua to have each anti inflammatory, each uh, antiviral, and each antioxidant activities. Uh, but uh, there is also a politic region. Huh? You know, uh, normally it must be the scientific. Uh, that uh, announce the effect of uh, the CVO. But uh, uh, unfortunately, uh, it was the president, uh, and we chose the president uh, who uh, announced the uh, activity of uh, the preparation. And uh, the announce is uh, take a international envergure, unfortunately. Um, 
Whiskey with the friend. Ah, I have a translation of uh, question of prof. Uh, as uh, I uh, said later, uh, it is very, very difficult to know at uh, what stage of uh, disease uh, is the patient. It is very difficult. Uh, scientifically, if uh, you have uh, an infectious disease, we ne you need the immunity reaction of uh, your organism. It's necessary. If uh, you introduce anti-inflammatory drug during this uh, viral stage, that inhibit the immunitory reaction of your organism. But uh, the concern, the main concern is that uh, if you ent uh, intervene, okay. if uh, your intervention is uh, very late, huh? uh, the most dangerous about uh, this uh, COVID-19 is, uh, COVID is uh, the overproduction of uh, uh, ROS, reactive oxygen species, uh, which, which uh, were very, very dangerous for our cells. And uh, uh, the cytokine storm, which uh, provoke a complication on many systems, especially cardiovascular system. He, uh, all the uh, deaf person uh, linked to the COVID-19 is uh, due to the thrombose on the uh, heart and on the pulmonary system, on the uh, 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 pulmonary system. Is it okay? Like... Uh, Response. Yeah. Thank it, you. Thank you, okay. Prof. Uh, prof, that, there is another question written already in French. Although we would want to go straight to that question, but uh, Reverend uh, Adodo is already ready to for his presentation, so we will take that and come back to the questions later. So, Reverend Ashley, we will have you now. Yeah. Thank you very much. Um, and thank you for inviting me. I will, I will be speaking uh, briefly uh, about uh, COVID-19 and uh, herbal medicine research in Africa. Uh, I am uh, in the same field, similar to Dr. Rebecca. I'm a medical sociologist, anthropology, but I am also in the field of management, innovation, and technology. So I, I stand between the, uh, natural sciences, the pharmacists, and the anthropologists. Uh, I teach herbal medicine at the University of Ecuador in Nigeria. And uh, I'm also yeah. managing a, one of the largest uh, producers of herbal supplements in Africa, I would say which is where I'm talking from now, where we have more than 120 full-time workers, uh, uh, including pharmacists, microbiologists, biochemists, macognosis, all working together. So in a way, I'll be speaking from a, both a theory and practice. Uh, my first point about talking about herbal medicine is that we are still having the challenge of and nomenclature terminologies, alternative medicine, natural medicine, traditional medicine, herbal medicine. Uh, we need to arrive at a definite uh, terminology if we have to make progress in the development of uh, African herbal medicine. 
I would prefer to use the term African herbal medicine. So my, that's one of my experiences over the past few years. And uh, secondly, African herbal medicine or traditional medicine, whatever you call it, is part of what we call indigenous African knowledge systems, which also include music, art, poetry, uh, dance, uh, these other aspects of uh, African indigen indigenous systems, they manage to emerge into an objective area of study. So people can now study African music, African arts from different parts of the world without uh, any danger of uh, stigma stigmatization. But African herbal medicine did not escape from this. So that's why we have this problem of nomenclature and uh, stereotyping of uh, African herbal medicine. And I will quickly uh, want to state that in terms of COVID-19 uh, research, you know, the experience of last year, it is not very clear that we need to be very practical in talking about uh, what we call African herbal medicine and distinguish the herbal medicine that is used in terms of religion, uh, as you may have noticed, once we begin to speak about traditional medicine, immediately we are talking about witchcraft, religion, uh, belief systems, and all kinds of practices, uh, which is good, but we need to acknowledge that and keep it aside and speak about African herbal medicine as a venture, as a business venture. I'm saying this because from all I can see, we cannot speak profitably about African herbal medicine unless we speak about it also as a business venture. Uh, as you may be aware, the herbal medicine business globally today is worth over $2 billion. Now, Africa, which has more than 50% of the natural resources, the plant resources grow in Africa, they have less than 1% share in this global uh, business venture. So I think in Africa, we are always in danger of being quick to run to religion when we are speaking about traditional African medicine. And I will you know, be speaking about it in the, in the area of when we talk of, of, about patenting African herbal medicine. We cannot patent uh, traditional African medicine, but we can patent pure compounds that is extracted from African herbal medicine. Now, in Africa, we have not been doing this, but other people have been doing this. Uh, for example, uh, there's a, a medicinal plant, which is very common in Nigeria. It's called Calabar bean, uh, Phaistostigma venenosum, which you know, has been, uh, the compound uh, Phaistostigmin has been isolated from this plant, can be patented, and it is generating billions of dollars, not for Africa, but from the researchers who came from Europe and America, and it is being used in the, in the treatment of Parkinson's disease and glaucoma. So it is patented, but it is based on a plant growing here in Africa and uh, very common in Nigeria. So we in Africa, we need to be very practical and separate traditional medicine as religious, as piety, from herbal medicine as a scientific venture and business venture. Otherwise, we'll keep on going around in a circle. So I agree with the past speakers, especially with Dr. Rebecca, you know, our approach, anthropological approach, social approach, which is very important. And uh, for Africa today, we need to explore these other aspects. So my experience uh, last year during the COVID-19 venture, I was very much involved in 
no uh, doing research into uh, herbal medicine, herbal alternative for COVID-19. The experience, my own experience and what we have experienced here is that in Africa, it is very, very difficult to separate scientific research from politics and economics. That is simply the, the, the reality uh, on ground that the politicians, they, they only invest in what is going to benefit them. And uh, the interest is most times selfish. It has to benefit them. So uh, political will, political interest will always be vital. So in Africa, we cannot do scientific research independently uh, unless there's some involvement, either of the government or an independent financial investors who we invest in research into African uh, medicinal uh, remedies. So there are three stages in the production, or in, in the preparation of herbal medicine. We are the first stage, which is the raw production, what people call concussions, decoctions. Uh, it is valid. Uh, it requires boiling leaves or drying roots into powder. Now, this is very limited because there's a limit to how much you can produce from this. And at this first stage, it is difficult to know which particular substance is active in this. So most times when people talk about herbal medicine, they only look at it from this point of view, that how do you know which substance is working and how do you isolate it? But on that level, herbal medicine can assist there because the people who operate on that level, they are in the local communities, they only aim at providing remedies to the local, immediate local communities. They are not interested in producing pharmaceutical drugs that will be distributed globally. So that is one stage. And then from the raw production, you can begin to go into crude extracts, which is where you try to isolate as much as you can uh, some of the active compounds, which you don't know yet, but at least you, you refine, you remove the, the shell, the fiber, so that you, you have a cleaner a compound, which you can have not yet named. At that stage, you may be able to control the dosage so that you can reduce the dosage from maybe half a liter into uh, 10 mil, 10 milliliter, whatever. That's what you will achieve at that uh, stage. And then the third stage is when you now go into pure isolation of active compounds. And if you're able to do that with a synthesized, of course, it is no longer a herbal product at that. You can claim that it is it originated from plants, but when you synthesize, you will be able to multiply it in large quantity so that it can be available to billions of people globally. So those are the three stages. For uh, when we're doing the trying to do clinical research in uh, for COVID-19 about drug last year, we had the challenge of being innovative enough, you know, dealing with WHO, the World Health Organization, to design a peculiar protocol for clinical research in herba medicine, rather than imposing the normal pharmaceutical uh, globalized method of clinical trial to the use of herba medicine. Because if you are doing clinical trial based on the crude extracts, the raw materials, uh, you need to design what we can call a retrospective clinical trial, which means you go back to the past three, four years to monitor who have been taking these products and what has, has been the effect. Uh, so the World Health Organization and the government official, they were, they were not keen about that, but eventually they were able to see you know, that that is actually the way to go that we need to be more innovative rather than imposing only one uh, way 
of looking at uh, reality uh, in uh, the use of herbal uh, medicine. Now, uh, with regard to the production of vaccines, the, the reality is that Africa, well, let me speak about uh, where I am in Nigeria. We do not have the capacity, the material capacity. We may have the intellectual capacity, but the material capacity, the political will uh, to produce vaccines. That is simply the reality. And if we do have the capacity, the energy should be channeled toward the production of vaccines for malaria, which is more of a problem. Because as I speak to you, more people see that of malaria, asthma, and diabetes in Nigeria and in Africa. So we do not have the, the capacity. And secondly, we need to remind ourselves that a vaccine is not a medicine for the cure of the virus. The vaccine is actually meant to help you not to for uh, not to die of uh, COVID-19. It simply means you boost your immune system so that you uh, do not you know, become too weak to cope with the vaccine. And uh, the question is now with so much emphasis and all the attention being channeled to production of vaccines, we are not yet. And no longer speaking about the, the medicine, the treatment, the cure for uh, COVID-19. And that is why a uh, professor uh, nursing is here from Madagascar. Uh, many people in Africa, they were impressed with the political will shown by the president of Mad Madagascar uh, with the COVID openings. Uh, not because it is uh, foolproof that it has been proven to, to work without fail, but just the, the political will that is very much needed in, uh, in Africa, which is, is not there. Uh, and uh, we need more of that if traditional medicine is going to uh, move forward. I listened to Dr. Rebecca speaking about the advantages and disadvantages of state involvement in um, herbal medicine research in Africa. It will always be a challenge until we have enough entrepreneurs across Africa who uh, understand the importance of research and they come together to fund research, clinical research into African herbal medicine. So my recommendations then we, uh, of course, talking about Madagascar uh, uh, at, at the Missy Anua, which uh, we have in our farm in uh, those states, Nigeria, we have uh, quite a lot of them growing. We have been using them for the management of malaria for quite some uh, time. So, we, the problem of uh, herbal medicine research in Africa also, I think, is the lack of uh, cooperation between the researchers in, uh, in Africa. Uh, I see African scientists always on the next plane to somewhere in Europe or America going to do research. They are not flying over to Madagascar, to Uganda, to South Africa, to Kenya. Rather, they are going to somewhere in Europe or America for conferences and uh, conferences and seminars, and they come back and they do not. Uh, so there is more cooperation, both in trade, in knowledge sharing between Europe and uh, Africa, than between Africa and Africa. So why we uh, sometimes speak about colonialism, we also need to critique ourselves, our orientation, our worldview. If we both as scientists, as social scientists, as uh, uh, pure natural scientists, if we are doing enough to promote our African herbal medicine. So my recommendation, and that is what I've been doing. In fact, my latest book just was published last year, Africology, is 
uh, about deconstructing knowledge in Africa, deconstructing and then reconstructing knowledge, social knowledge and scientific knowledge in Africa. So for the way forward for Africa is for Africans to come together and see how we can power our indigenous knowledge system. It's not a question of whether herbal medicine is uh, effective or not. It is a problem of the challenge of coordination, challenge of belief in what we have. Otherwise, we will continue to have um, many people from outside Africa coming to discover uh, life-saving drugs in Africa, extracting active compounds, synthesize them, and then they, they make a lot of material economic sources from this. While we Africa, we continue to speak about religion, about prayer, about communal living, which is good, but we also need to explore herbal medicine as a business venture. So I will stop there because I know there are many questions uh, from the speakers so that we can hear from you. Thank you. Um, thank you, Reverend uh, Ashley. I, your presentation was a very fascinating one. And I, before I hand over to my colleague, Dr. Uh, George, I'd want to quickly ask a question. You know, in your presentation, you spoke about the business aspect of African medicine. However, I want to ask, you know, talking of the practicality, uh, the practicality of African traditional medicine, and I am very conversant with one of the uh, COVID-19 immune booster that you developed in your research center. I would want to ask, um, what are the protocols you, you put in place when, um, uh, when you want to um, discover drugs and uh, the development of such uh, traditional medicine and um, the clinical procedures you used in the production of those drugs? Yes, uh, thank you. Yes, we were among the first uh, in Nigeria last year, uh, partly inspired by the development in uh, Madagascar to develop this uh, herbal supplements, as we call it. Uh, it's actually an immune booster. And uh, we, it's not new. During, the, during Ebola, we were very much involved, we were very much active when Ebola came. So we, already did develop a formulation for Ebola. But when Ebola was no longer a big threat to the Nigerian government, they lost interest in the formulation that we were dealing with them with. So we were not starting from nowhere when we formulated the, the product, the supplement for COVID-19. So we began with the preclinical trials, animal trials, uh, we started uh, nine months earlier, as soon as uh, COVID appeared in China, we knew that it was just a matter of time before it, it will appear in Nigeria. So we went through the clinical trials, the animal trials, and uh, tried to go to the stage of the crude extracts of, of, of the products. And uh, uh, part of the ingredients have been used for the management of asthma, malaria, so we are familiar, we have 20 years experience of preclinical trials, and we have also been involved in a, a clinical trial on, on a small scale. So that is what we, we did. And when the product came out, we presented it to the government that to do a stage two and stage three clin clinical trial in uh, Nigeria, for in, anywhere in Africa, you will need no less than, I would say, a hundred million dollars. Now, we don't have that. That is why you will always need the involvement of the state. Uh, what happened in uh, Oxford during the, the development of the vaccine, you know, for, you know, some of you may know how much the UK government uh, spent in supporting them and the same with uh, Pfizer, which already has a big you know, 
uh, ports already. So that is what we, it was meant to be a product that can now go through stage two and three clinical trial, but we could not go for that because it was too expensive. So that is what we did. Meanwhile, having passed through the regulatory agencies, it was approved as safe for public consumption. It was distributed widely across the country. and uh, it's, it's now available online across Europe and the US. And we are collating the reports from the people, very impressive reports, which we help to proceed further when we are ready for the stage two clinical trial. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Reverend. I would want to hand over to my colleague, uh, Bishi, Dr. Bishi George, to anchor the question and answer session. To myself. Uh, thank you so much, um, colleagues. Uh, I must say, I enjoyed the presentation. Uh, I hope you are here. The lack, the lack of interest on the part of uh, most African governments uh, is partly due to you know, the problem uh, I mentioned. The, the fact that we always limit uh, African herbal medicine to traditional medicine, traditional medicine, which involves uh, rituals, dance, and now you know the impact of Christianity, how Christianity has even brought more confusion, in the sense that uh, if you call yourself a Sangoma or a native doctor, people already brand you as a, a juju priest, as a wicked person, and uh, a lot of confusion there. So some African leaders tend to now push this to the realms of the irrational, the unscientific. So those are the alternative names that are used for traditional medicine. Non-scientific medicine, uh, folk medicine, ethno medicine, and all kinds of things. But uh, if we set up the practice herbal medicine practice as a science, as a discipline in itself, which can be developed uh, so that we now different departments, orthopedic, psychiatrists, mental health, you know, uh, uh, general infections, uh, we will be able to have a body of knowledge. So the problem, the second problem in Africa is that the knowledge of herbal medicine seem to be lodged within individual practitioners. So it is more implicit than explicit. And unlike Western medical knowledge, which is explicit, everybody calls, comes and contributes to this body of knowledge. So it is objective and explicit, and you build on it in such a way that if a medical practitioner commits an offense or makes a mistake, you can sanction him or her, but that does not mean that the discipline of medicine is, is bad or is not effective. But in herbal medicine, when a traditional healer makes a mistake, people condemn the whole practice of uh, herbal medicine as bad, and uh, that has not impacted on the growth of... Uh, so when one makes a mistake or is, there's no standards, being followed, people simply condemn the whole field of herbal medicine. And most times we need to depend on outsiders to come and tell us the value of what we have. Yeah, so that is the problem. And then totally the African government, they have not seen the economic potential. Uh, they have not separated the economic enterprise aspect from the religious and the cultural aspects. So once they see it as something worth investing in, I can assure you they will invest in it. That's my own approach. Uh, rather than blaming the government, uh, I tell the practitioners to come together, get investors, let's prove what is possible, and then the government would like to, would like to invest into that. All right, thank you, thank you. Um, now the platform is open. 
can have some questions. Can I have some questions uh, or comments from the audience? Yes, Prof. Sindo. Yeah, uh, thank you so much, uh, Reverend Father and so Adodo. Um, I just want to find out what your response to this would be. Um, in the 1990s and before then, particularly before neoliberalism became such a dominating force in African political and economic systems, it seems to be that a number of African countries were having institutes and entities that were producing drugs. Yeah, um, I wanted to find out that, if, I mean, if in the case of Nigeria, if at all the Medical Research Institute at, uh, did attempt to engage uh, with the herbal medical uh, uh, people at all or not. Related to that question is whether you at this moment, because you argued that there is a lack of material. In other words, I think you are referring to um, uh, infrastructure such as the laboratories and so on that one could use to, for purposes of those stages of uh, extracting the herbal medicine. Um, I want to know whether your organization works closely with the Nigerian Institute of Medical Research at all, or whether you are tempted to work with them and yes, that, uh, collaboration been fruitful. What are the bottlenecks, if there are any? So thank you for that. It's also just to say at this point, um, I have hijacked my friend, uh, uh, Professor Patrice Mepu, who is a French professor. So uh, he will uh, probably type or interject uh, when it comes to asking questions to for the benefit of our uh, French uh, panelist uh, here, uh, Professor David. So thank you very much, uh, Reverend Father. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much for that interesting question. Um, a few years ago, I think three years ago, the Nigerian uh, Institute of Medical Research uh, set up a unit for HEBA complementary and alternative medicine herbal research. And uh, I was appointed a visiting fellow of that institute uh, three years ago. Um, part of my work there is to help to, to develop this center and you know, to do research. Uh, we were very much particularly about uh, malaria because you know, my personal opinion has been that it's a shame that Africa has not produced a good, recognizable, verified herbal medicine for malaria, which is our problem. We are waiting for a vaccine or whatever to come from outside Africa. So it was so we have such a partnership. Apart from me being a, a research visiting fellow, there was an official memorandum of understanding between Paxava, my organization, and the Nigerian Institute of Medical Research in uh, Lagos. So there's close uh, collaboration between us. Uh, we also have an uh, MOU with the Nigerian uh, Institute of Industrial Research, uh, which was meant to look after industrialization, industry, machines, Nigeria. So, we also have an MOU with them. So we are very much at the center of uh, research into uh, herbal medicine. And I will tell you, they have one complaint. Uh, that, one, that complaint is always no funding, 
no funding. Uh, but I see the, the funds are coming gradually, but it seems never to be enough. So, and uh, so for more than three years, I've uh, even composed a nice music based on this. That's no money, no money, no money, no money. And uh, we are still waiting. Thank you very much. All right, thank you. Uh, now I have Professor Nelson, Nelson Mujime, please get the floor. Yes, uh, thank you colleagues. And uh, Rev, thanks a lot for, for that insightful presentation and uh, conversation that we've been having so far. When you started, you, you raised a very important point on nomenclature, you know? that uh, indeed to some people is herbal medicine, to others is traditional medicine, to others is African herbal medicine. And name matters. The way you, you, you think of something is reflected in the name. So I want your reflection on your, your, your thinking about what is it that we're actually talking about? What is the name of this animal that we are trying to describe. For me, I'm a bit worried when we refer to indigenous knowledge because the, the word indigenous in itself is problematic. Okay, so I will, I will want your reflection on that. And then secondly, I have been doing a, a project for some time now for the Department of Environmental Affairs in South Africa looking at pharmaceuticals as environmental pollutants. And one of the tasks we are asked to explore is alternatives. You know, so if the so-called Western medicines are polluting environment and water resources, what else can we do? And what came up was this so-called um, uh, ethnomedicine and what we're referring to as herbal medicine here. Yeah. So what is stopping us from really advancing this discipline within the academia so that one could actually study it as a program, a degree, because you made mention of African music, people can actually study that. So I, I need your reflection on that as well, because from an environmental perspective, where I see it, that would, uh, seems to me that uh, is going to benefit us. So thank you. Yes, uh, thank you very much. Yes, let me begin from the last uh, point. Uh, at the moment, there is at the University of Ibadan in Nigeria, a master's and PhD program on traditional African medicine. That is the PhD program. Uh, I'm a lecturer in that unit at the Institute of African Studies in Ibadan, Nigeria. Uh, so I lectured there. It, it used to be called ethnomedicine, but three years ago, we insisted that it should be called traditional African medicine and belief systems, uh, which I didn't agree to. But the problem is that once again, it is being studied as more of a African belief system because nearby, Close to the institute is the Department of Botany, and here the Department of Pharmacy. And now they, they are not working together. The people, uh, the students who are studying masters and PhD in traditional, traditional African medicine, they are studying it as if it is just cultural tradition. That's also where you study media studies, uh, cultural studies. Uh, so uh, why? is the Department of Pharmacy not working with those at the Institute and the Botany Department not coming together to work together to see how they can develop this. Part of the problem to be nomenclature, as you rightly mentioned, names matter. And I agree with you, it's very, very important uh, that we call it what it is. So if we call it herbal medicine research, for example, African, uh, medicine research, probably it will help to bring everyone together. Then we can now focus on the different aspects of that. So I think that is 
it's very important that we get the 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 names clear. I understand that in South in South Africa, you can now study witchcraft, yeah, which is good uh, and interesting, so that people will understand because you don't condemn what you don't understand. So I think that is very important. So uh, that is one of the, the the challenges. And until we have the right name terminology, we may not be able to to work together. And uh, about drug production, it's a very complex uh, uh, system. Even herbal medicine can also damage the environment. I mean, I work in a rural community. I see how people go to the forest to cut down trees because they want to produce herbal medicine uh, from this. So whether it is Western allopathic medicine or the herbal medicine, we need to have the culture of you know, proper approach to preserving the environment because people call down trees because they want to address the, the leaf. Like for example, Anuna Murikata, which is called Sawaso uh, in Nigeria. People, there's a lot of demand for this uh, plant uh, because people believe that the leaves of this plant is good for cancer. And people are simply cutting the leaves now you can hardly find this plant easily everywhere because people are cutting, nobody is cultivating. So I think we need to develop a protocol. So there should be a law forbidding people from cutting down trees. So if you are in the herbal medicine uh, business, you should have a farm where you harvest your, 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 your plants from. So what you are doing uh, is very, very important to come and draw attention to these very important aspects of, of uh, African herbal medicine. And uh, we call it indigenous knowledge because I can assure you, uh, I have worked uh, in my research uh, when I was working as an ethno ethnographer with different communities where traditional healers, they treat those who have mental illnesses, where the trees, those who have bone, no leg fractures, and I've worked with them, document how they treat. There's a very complicated system, knowledge system in place. Unfortunately, these people, they do not write them down. Their children have run away to the cities in Abuja or Lagos, so they get old and they die. For me, that is a tragedy for Africa. Uh, so it's very complex. 